we have strong African-American businesses, it's going to also anchor our, our churches, our civil rights organizations, our community organizations right there in our own communities. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and you're watching WashingtonPostLive.com. John W. Rogers Jr. is co-CEO and chief investment officer of Ariel Investments, a firm with assets under management totaling more than $10 billion. He's a veteran crusader for racial equality and serves on the boards of McDonald's, Nike, the New York Times, and the Barack Obama Foundation. In fact, he also served as co-chair of the former president's inaugural committee in 2009. And with that, I am pleased to welcome him here now. John, welcome to Washington Post Live. Great to be here. So you founded Ariel Investments in the early 1980s and grew it into the largest minority-owned investment firm. You've been in finance and in the corporate world for a long time. Generally speaking, what needs to be done to see more diversity in upper management and in the C-suite? Well, I think we have to, as one thing is, we are a money management firm and a mutual fund company, and we own shares in many, many publicly traded companies. I think it's one thing, it's very, it's very important for owners of the stock to insist that corporations have diversity in the C-suite and on their board of directors. It's kind of us, up to us as shareholders to push them to do the right thing and hold them accountable. Secondly, those of us that are fortunate to be in the boardroom, those of us from a progressive community, we also have to hold management accountable to live up to the values that they say they believe in and that they talk about all of the time. And so given that, and in the tenor and tone of the times that we're in now, it seems as though uh, folks are more open and are, are hearing but given your experience, your decades long experience in, in the corporate world, how likely is it that this sort of wokeness that we see now can be maintained? Well, I'm optimistic. Uh, as I've talked to the CEOs of the companies that I'm engaged and involved in, more people seem to be very, very serious this time, uh, reaching out to have more diverse boards to do the right things. And I'm really optimistic. The other thing that I'm optimistic about is that we have really progressive political leadership now in Congress, that now that we are in the leadership there, we're really able to make a difference with the most diverse Congress in history. When you have a leader like Maxine Waters at the House Financial Services Committee and a Congresswoman Joyce Beatty chairing the subcommittee there, they're pushing these corporations to do the right thing, not only the diversity of their teams, but pushing them to do business with African-American firms. You know, it's one thing to give us micro loans, it's one thing to give us donations, but the really, it's really, really important that they commit to doing business with Black-owned businesses. And so I found it interesting, you, you mentioned how we have the most diverse Congress that we've had in history, but as you know, some of the stats that were shown in the opening video, you know, that diversity doesn't extend itself to corporate America and certainly to corporate, to corporate boards. You know, Pamela Newkirk in her book, Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, you know, she writes about the pipeline of African-Americans for board memberships or actually the lack thereof and about how the same black people seem to be nominated and passed around from one board to another. From your experience, do you think that that's a lack of imagination on those the, the part of those boards or uh, a lack of contacts or both? I think it, it's both. There is a lack of imagination. People are not stretching out and looking broadly for all the African-American talent out there. As Reverend Jackson always says, you know, baseball got to be a better sport once we started, once Jackie Robinson started to play and he was quickly followed by Ernie Banks and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays and all these extraordinarily talented players who weren't allowed to play. The owners back then said the blacks weren't good enough to play, to play baseball. But of course, we showed that once we were on the playing field and the rules were clear, we were going to be superstars. So the talent is there. There's not a pipeline issue. There are many, many talented folks who can be in the C-suite, be on the boards and contribute mightily in making our companies stronger and making our country stronger. Okay, so the, the pipeline is there. Um, you sit on corporate boards. I named, I named some of them. In your experience, when you come to the table and say, look, 
Here are these um, companies and firms that are that are run by people of color who are excellent and they should be given some of our business or they should be allowed to participate in some of our business. What kind of reaction do you get? Is there resistance or is there openness? Most of the time, you know, because I've been on companies that kind of know my value, people have been open to hearing and discussing it. And that's been 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 terrific. I think one of the challenges that we face as African American entrepreneurs the last 30 years or so is that all the well-intentioned uh, programs revolve around what they call supplier diversity. And our country, as you know, has become more of a professional services, financial services, and technology-based economy. That's where the wealth and jobs and power is created today. And we haven't evolved to that world of using African Americans in everything that we do. Uh, at the University of Chicago, where I'm vice chairman of the board, we coined a term, uh, instead of being supplier diversity, we call it business diversity, to really be able to showcase that we want to do business with everybody in everything that we do. And currently there at the University of Chicago, they work with 90 uh, professional services firms, everything from law firms to accounting firms, advertising agencies, public relations firms, money managers for the endowment. It's been extraordinarily well received. And it's only the right thing to do. It's made the university stronger and they're very proud of it. And it's given these African-American entrepreneurs opportunities to build really larger and larger businesses because they have the university as an anchor customer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what we're talking about here broadly is, is systemic racism, the, the, the big wall that that is. And I would love for you to talk about your family history, uh, in, because it is a prime example of what happens when systemic racism fueled by white, fueled by white supremacy takes hold. You, your family originates or had had strong roots in Tulsa. Talk about Tulsa and how that figures prominently in your story. Well, I've been very, very fortunate um, to have some really dynamic leaders in my family, all entrepreneurs, people who are willing to stand up and fight for justice. And so my great, great father, great, great grandfather, J.B. Stratford, owned the Stratford Hotel in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that was burned down in the famous uh, Tulsa race riots almost 100 years ago. He was an extraordinary leader in the community. And he was ultimately one of the wealthiest entrepreneurs in the nation at the time. And his hotel was one of the largest in the country. So to have that destroyed, it was a heartbreaking time for our family. It was just so, so wrong on so many levels. He had to escape Tulsa because there was rumors that he was going to be arrested after the riots, be blamed for the riots, and then possibly lynched. So he escaped, got to Chicago, where my grandfather, his son, used his legal skills to stop Tulsa from extraditing him back to Tulsa. So my mom often says that she was inspired to be a lawyer because she saw her father save her grandfather's life. And it was just very, very inspiring. Um, my mom ended up being the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School, um, where she met my dad on the first day of school. And uh, he was a returning Tuskegee Airman. And so I was fortunate to have these pioneering um, you know, parents, it's also a part of my life. And then finally, my grandfather, who saved you know, his father's life, he was also a very extraordinarily talented civil rights lawyer and was involved with the Lorraine Hansberry's case around restrictive covenants and actually argue, helped argue a case in the Supreme Court to be able to relieve those restrictive covenants. So I've had these dynamic, strong, pioneering family members who inspired me to speak up and to try to, try to fight for economic justice as well as social justice. And I ask you to, to, ta to tell that story because you testified before, I believe it was Financial Services Committee last week, and you told that you talked about this, you talked about your, your family history. Why were you there testifying before Congress? What was the purpose? Well, the purpose was really to uh, help build support for the HEROES Act, because we know that because of the discrimination that we face in this country, over since you know 1619, of course, but looking at the challenges that we've had, whenever we've gotten a little bit ahead, our African American businesses get destroyed, and then we have had Jim Crow, we've had outright racism, we've had all the challenges that we've faced in our society and the restrictive covenants that I asked about earlier, 
So now when we get into this pandemic, of course, African-American entrepreneurs don't have generational wealth and deep pockets to help us to weather this extraordinary storm. Uh, we don't have family members who can write a check from their inheritances to help because we didn't have an opportunity to build wealth in prior generations because of historical discrimination. So I was there to really talk about the challenges that we as African-American entrepreneurs face in this country today and why it's so important that the things that are being pushed uh, from the Democratic Congress are so critical to being able to get the cash flow into the hands of African-American entrepreneurs to keep our businesses alive, to keep those jobs flowing, to have our own local communities be stronger and stronger, which of course is tied to so many of the social issues that we face in our society. So this is really, really important that we pass this HEROES Act. Um, you mentioned you mentioned generational wealth, um, and that sounds like a, a very sort of long-term um, strategic um, endeavor. But what is the best way to start accumulating that generational wealth for African Americans? Well, it's, it's, it's a couple things. I think one of the most important things is to start to invest early. You know, when you graduate from college, you get that first job, join, join your 401k plan and invest with a long-term perspective. That is critically important. We have often in our community not been comfortable in the market because we didn't have multi-generational wealth. We didn't spend as much time learning about the stock market. We didn't have a grandfather or often or a grandmother or aunt or uncle coaching us about the market and teaching us how they had invested their money because they hadn't done that. So one of the things we've done at Ariel over 20 years ago, we started the Ariel Community Academy with former Secretary uh, Arnie Duncan. And Arnie and I and his sister Sarah helped to create a small public school where we would teach kids about the stock market. And we think it's very important for financial services companies to partner with urban public schools to not only teach kids about the markets and how to invest, but also to be role models so that these young people can think about financial services careers for the first time. And that's worked very well for us, the Aerial Community Academy. And we'd love, to, again, to see other institutions partner with urban public schools in a similar fashion. You know, as a result of, of the Black Lives Matter protests that have been going on around the country since late May, early June, has led to an awakening. We have seen companies say, proclaim uh, that Black lives do indeed matter. We've seen companies change their logos. Um, we have seen companies change their names. We've seen companies put the little black square on Instagram and show solidarity. And I bring all of this up because we have a question from Lee Beeman from California who asks, how can we maintain a sense of urgency so that we actually see changes beyond corporate statements? Well, I think um, we have to support uh, civil rights organizations that are out there fighting for economic justice. You know, Mark Morial, at the uh, National Urban League, Reverend Shar Sharpton, Reverend Jackson, um, many others that are doing the right thing because they put pressure on corporate America to keep, they keep the pressure on. Also, we have to support the progressive political leaders that believe in this mission because often, you know, corporations as well as anchor institutions, hospitals, universities, spend a lot of money and hire a lot of people, they respond to their local congressperson. They respond to their local senator. They respond to their local mayors. You know, I grew up in a time when Maynard Jackson was the mayor of Atlanta and Harold Washington was the mayor of Chicago and Coleman Young in Detroit. They push hard and force corporations and anchor institutions to do the right thing. And so that mindset, that spirit, I think is critically, critically important. Uh, President, President, former President Obama, when he was in the state senate, he pushed hard to make sure the state was willing to work with minority, minority businesses and at the same time push the anchor institutions to do the right thing, large corporations and again, hospitals, universities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned at the beginning of your answer about donating to, to uh, organizations that are in the uh, racial equality space. And that actually dovetails nicely with the second question that we have. This one from Minnesota from Edward Skelly, and he asks, do you think large publicly announced personal contributions made to social slash racial justice organizations by well-paid executives have a significant impact? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, we have a conference for African-Americans on corporate boards. 
been around now for about 18 years. Charles Tribbett from Russell Reynolds helped to start the uh, conference with Melody Hobson and myself. And what we've done there is we've told everyone that comes to the conference, all the African-American directors, we'd like them to model three Ps. One is philanthropy. We want them to go to their corporate boards and push those executives and those organizations to give more to black institutions that care about economic justice. So philanthropy is important, but I mentioned this in my testimony, it's not enough. We have to, have to what we talked about earlier, have to hold accountable the second P, people. We wanna make sure that we're measuring the executive ranks of the corporations that we're on, and that we're measuring the people that work for all the suppliers who work for large corporations and large anchor institutions. And then finally, the third P is purchasing. If we really want to bring change and close the wealth gap, we have to push large institutions to work with black businesses in everything that we do, as we've talked about. And that's why this P, the third P is critically important and keep track of the spending by category. So it's just not that one very important construction contract can sort of sound really great, but then who's getting the investment banking contract? Who's getting the legal contract? Who's getting the accounting contract, the technology contract? So we wanna be included in everything so that we can close the wealth gap. Because we know in today's society, we look at where the wealth is, large private equity firms, large hedge firms, hedge fund firms, the large businesses in Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the areas where we've been the most excluded from over generation to generation to generation. I want to um, let you, get you to be clear on something, especially given the last answer you gave. You're not asking for some kind of quote unquote set aside or quota. You're asking for, hey, give us a seat at the table and we can show you what we can do. Exactly right. It's so critical. Uh, you know, one of the things that Bob Zimmer talks about at the University of Chicago, and I know that other corporations are doing this very well. Exelon does a great, great job. Um, McDonald's does a great job. Some of the other institutions, the Federal Home Loan Bank here in Chicago does a great job in these areas. Everyone believes that once you're going and searching for talent everywhere, you're going to make the organization stronger. You're going to have diverse perspectives, diverse points of view in the boardroom as you're making decisions. And at the same time, anytime you're building a team, the further you look out for talent, the better the team's going to be. You know, if I'm building a basketball team, my former love, you know, I love basketball. If I'm only, you know, picking players from Hyde Park where I grew up, my team's only going to be so good. If I can go out nationally and recruit talent, my team's going to be better. If you can search out throughout the world for talent, the team's going to be better. So we understand that we are talented, gifted entrepreneurs out there and gifted African-American leaders out there that just need the chance to show that they can really shine and be superstars in the business world. I, I like the fact that you bring up, uh, bring up talent and looking for talent. And you mentioned someone in particular, Melody Hobson, who is your, co, your co-CEO. You met her when she was 17 and she followed in your footsteps. She also went she also went to Princeton and that made me wonder about the value and importance of mentorships. Can you talk about the value of mentorships in everything that you're doing? Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, you know, I met Melody as a prospective Princeton student. I was volunteering to help recruit minority students to Princeton. And it was kind of like a nice thing because what Coach Carrillo always taught me, my coach at Princeton, was if you're thinking about your teammates first, good things happen. So I met my most valuable player by volunteering to help Princeton recruit minority students. Uh, so it worked out extraordinarily well. And I was an early mentor uh, for Melody. I think now she's one of my mentors. She's been so extraordinarily successful, so dynamic, and such a great leader. Um, but mentors have been very important to me. When I grew up here in Chicago, you had a John Johnson who had built Johnson Publishing, Ebony and Jet. He was this great role model. George Johnson had created Afrosheen and Ultrasheen hair care products, and started Independence Bank, the largest black bank in the country. Extraordinary you know, role models for me and mentors. When I would go have a trouble with my business, I would go see them, ask them for their, for their advice. So I was lucky to have people like that in my life who would help along the way. And of course, some of my business uh, leaders in town also were helpful. And most one I remember most readily was uh, Ned Janata, who, who was the managing partner of William Blair when I started there in my career. And I was there for two years before I started Ariel. 
but he was always still there for me whenever I had ideas or concerns or something I was thinking about as I was building uh, the first African-American-owned money management firm in the country. You know, speaking, talk more about mentorships, because I'm sure there are people who, who might be watching this live stream now or who, who might watch it you know, days down the road or even months or years down the road who might be wondering, well, how, what makes a good mentor? How do I get one? Um, has anyone ever asked you that question? And if so, what do you tell them? I get, you know, we get a lot of, Melody and I get a lot of requests from people wanting uh, to, uh, you know, us to mentor them. And I think that, um, you know, what I tell people, join nonprofit organizations, get involved, roll up your sleeve, show you care about people beyond yourself. You know, you're going to be a good teammate. You care about your country, you care about your community. And that's important. Get involved in a political campaign. You know, it transformed my life to be able to work for Carol Mosley Braun when she became the first black woman senator, to work for President Obama when he became the first African-American president. Getting into the trenches, working hard on a campaign that's important is something where you meet lots of great people. And then those people, when they see you working hard on behalf of the team, then it's easy to call up those other leaders that you've met along the way and say, can I have some, I need some advice here. I need some help. And they are like more willing to help, more willing to be there for you because they've seen you contribute to a broader cause. And they've seen you live up the commitments you make to others and to see how hard you can work. And then they're willing to help you to that, get to that next stage. You know, I want to bring you back to diversity in um, corporate America on boards within organizations. You know, one of my other hats is as an MSNBC contributor, and we now have a new um, NBC Universal News Group chairman, Cesar Conde, who announced a couple of weeks ago new diversity goals, 50% women, 50% people of color. And the thing that I thought was interesting about the announcement is that he put some teeth behind it by tying those diversity goals to um, management and pay to evaluations and compens compensation. Is that, is that the way to ensure that these goals, if not are met, are taken seriously? I think, you know, um, that's important. I think if you hold people accountable with their pay to do the right things, it's gonna move the needle. But I also still think you have to have unconscious bias training, implicit bias training, because of this, you know, the history that we've had in this country, people often come in with a perspective that uh, we're not ready for some of these tough, tough jobs. As I've said earlier, nothing could be further from the truth. So I want to make sure we don't forget about that kind of training. Um, that's critical. But again, holding people accountable is important. And that's why it's so important to not only have African Americans on corporate boards, but have those that are willing to speak out and fight for justice once they're in the boardroom. At our Black Directors Conference, every year we bring speakers to remind those of us that are privileged to be in the boardroom that we have a responsibility to fight for justice. So over the years, we've had Harry Belafonte, we've had John Lewis, you know, he was terrific, of course, and very inspiring. We've had Andy Young and, and Reverend Jackson, we could go on and on and on, uh, Valerie Jarrett, people like that, Eric Holder, to remind people that, you know, we have a responsibility to fight for each other. And if you're in that boardroom and you're not pushing the social, and economic justice uh, goals really strongly, it gives that management team an out to not do the right thing. And so then what do you advise, you know, folks are at your conference, they get those marching orders. I can imagine folks leave that conference and feel inspired. How could you not feel inspired given the names you just named? But then they go to their, the boards upon which they sit and they, try to be that that uh, social advocate, but hit up against the brick wall. What advice do you give those those folks who are sitting on those boards who want to do the right thing, but it's falling on deaf ears if or, or also they're being ignored, like openly and willfully ignored? Well, two things. One of the things we truly try to do is have speakers, um, people like Bruce Gordon and Neil and Youngblood and others who effectively fought in the boardroom and made change to show people how to do it. But what I try to do when I'm in that boardroom, you know, one of my things my father always taught me is you live up to the commitments that you make to others. So if these institutions have commitments to diversity and inclusion, 
and they talk about it all the time. It's in their annual report. It's on their website. Their CEO is talking about it. And I feel as a director, I can tell them, I'm helping you to get your job done, to live up to this commitment you've made by reminding you consistently and often that you have to do these things you've said. Have more Black executives. Do more business with Black firms. Have more Black board members. You've got to do the job. Otherwise, you're making promises to others you're not keeping, and that's morally wrong. And that was just the way that I was brought up. So I pound away at that. At the end of the day, if I can't make change and I can't get the board members around to sort of come along, meet me part way, well, then it's time to resign from that board. You know, you can't just sit there, collect the fees and feel good about yourself. You're allowing all the economic opportunities to only go to white men. It's just not right. You know, we're in an extraordinary time in this country, not only in a political season, a presidential election season, but again, due to the protests that have been ongoing on American on streets of American cities all across the country uh, with Black Lives Matter protests. As my final question to you, what do you make of these times that we're in? It's very fraught but it also in some ways is a little hopeful. From your perspective, um, how do you view where we are as a country right now? Well, all I can do is you know, say that as I talk to my friends in the civil, civil rights movement, uh, my friend Arnie Duncan, uh, when I talk to my friend, Father Mike Blager here in Chicago, they're saying this is the worst they've ever experienced in their lives. The heartbreak is the most wrenching to see these young children being shot needlessly, it's just heartbreaking and just such something that we all should never have to live through in our country. So this has brought the worst of America onto national television, made it a worldwide event, and it's brutal. I think the only shining light is that there's some hope now that we can tell our story. More people are listening than ever. And hopefully this will be an opportunity for us to transform America and get us back on the right track where we can all respect each other, believe in each other, and create equal opportunity for everyone. One more question for you in terms of the, the momentum that we're seeing now from your perch as a, a member in a board member, corporate board member in the C-suite, this, this momentum that we're seeing now, can it be maintained? And if so, for how long? Is, in short, are we at an inflection point? in a positive sense? I think we are at an inflection point. Uh, this is the most hopeful I've been. I talk to my friends and my board members of Ariel Investments and Ariel, Ariel Mutual Funds. You know, I tell them I've been talking about this for 30 years, literally. Um, and now it seems like it's really resonating. And that's exciting. And I know there are many, many other leaders that are out around the country marching, having the tough conversations that are also feeling they're having, they're seeing change. You're seeing opportunity that just wasn't there six months ago. So we're moving in the right direction, and I am getting more and more hopeful. That is a great note to end on. John Rogers, thank you so much for coming to Washington Post Live. Thank you. And I want to remind our audience that you should head to WashingtonPostLive.com, where you can register for upcoming conversations and events. And we have a packed week of guests for you, including this afternoon's conversation with Mary Trump, a Thursday's conversation with Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, rumored to be being considered for vice president, and Friday's conversation with former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. But I want you to come back and join me on Thursday when I will be speaking with another potential Biden vice presidential running mate, Florida Congresswoman Val Demings. That will be at noon on Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in to Washington Post Live. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Have a good afternoon.